Thanks for joining us here at The Conversation. It's Adrian Lawrence and I have an incredible guest for you. Terrence Woodbury, a partner at Hit Strategies. That's a messaging and strategy firm that uses innovative research methods to understand, communicate with, and mobilize some of the hardest to reach communities in society. Terrence, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Adrian. Happy to be here. Yes, and also, hey, this is a perfect time for you. You study demographics and help people out. And right now, with the election coming, it is all about what groups are resonating with certain candidates. And I know you talk about reaching the least accessible communities. What does that look like? Absolutely. So at Hitchstrat, we focus on three primary audiences. We focus on millennials, on minorities, and on women. We consider that the ascending electorate, right? The rising electorate where most of the change is happening and where uh, and where Democrats have the most opportunity to really gain and, and begin to, uh, to to reposition themselves, not just in this election, but in, but in future elections as well. And Terrence, why is it so hard to reach these groups? Absolutely. So you know, we, we do polling and focus groups, and I, I, I get the luxury and the opportunity to, to sit in focus groups with young voters and diverse voters and women voters every single day. In fact, we just wrapped up some focus groups about five minutes ago that I can't wait to tell you about. Um, but you know, the, the fact of the matter is, far too often they're just not reflected in our research. They're not reflected in our polling. They're not reflected in, in the way that we design strategy. And so, a part of what we wanted to do here was to give voice to those voters to really uplift their stories, but to connect them to their power, their economic and political power, and, 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 and to help Democratic candidates and progressive candidates better reach these, uh, these hard to reach and high potential voters. We like to call them high potential and not low propensity. All right, well, I definitely can dig that. And I'd love to transition to a voting segment that is getting a fair amount of attention right now, which is black men. In 2016, Trump, he claimed about 14% of the black male vote. And I know he's trying to court the same group pretty aggressively right now. You recently wrote an article about Trump's strategy to win over black men. What's that strategy look like? It's, it, you know, it's interesting, Adrian. Uh, a lot of people started to pay attention to this around the RNC when we saw around the Republican National Convention, when we saw a lot of black men grace the Republican stage. Uh, but for me, I really started to notice that this was a, a part of, uh, of of Trump's winning strategy during the the Super Bowl in February, when he spent eleven million dollars on a single thirty second ad for Alice Johnson to be released from prison after twenty two years and to come out and say thank you so much, Donald J. Trump, hallelujah, as she wrapped her arms around her grandchildren for the first time. I knew then. With eleven million dollar investment during a program where you have more black men's eyes than any other time of the year, black men were not just a marginal part of Trump's strategy; they were his path to victory. And ever since then, we've seen him lean in to black men in a unique way, in a way that we have not often seen Republicans do. Um, in fact, just on the issue of criminal justice, we've seen Donald Trump's campaign, his official campaign. Prior to George Floyd's death, his campaign had spent $50,000 on criminal justice ads on Facebook. Since George Floyd's death, he spent $6.6 million on criminal justice Facebook ads. And what's interesting there, Adrian, is not just how much he's spending, it is also the issue that he spends the absolute most on, nothing else even close. Um, it's not just the amount that he's spending, but it's what he's saying in those ads. Democrats failed you. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris failed you, and that is why I signed the First Step Act and started letting black people out of jail. He's really leaning into this strategy, and we're beginning to see some efficacy of it. Wow, that really kind of hits me because that is a huge increase in money for these ads. And I know according to Gallup right now, Trump's approval rating is about eight points higher among black men than it is among black women. And it's also right now where this time of black men who are high profile coming out and partnering with Trump. For instance, Ice Cube, just the other day, we find out that he is working alongside Trump. How is this resonating with potential voters? Well, I think Ice Cube announced that he had reached out to both campaigns and that he was in the process of 
helping develop agendas for both campaigns. What we have seen is Donald Trump being the master marketer that he is, capitalize on that moment, um, uh, uh, amplify that moment. Uh, because it's, it's for Donald Trump, it's not enough for it to happen if the folks that he's talking to doesn't know what's happening. And that is what we have seen. You know, when I'm in focus groups with black men, and it specifically this, uh, this, this uh, margin of black men are considering supporting Trump, and I ask them, what is it about Donald Trump that makes you want to support him? Like clockwork, Adrian, they roll off the same three things. He invested in HBCUs, he's letting black folks out of jail, and he had the lowest unemployment rate um, in, in, in the black community in generations. If you look at any of Donald Trump's ads targeting black people, no matter what they're saying, no matter what his ads say, there's a checklist at the top of it. And the checklist are those three things. That is master marketing. Whether or not those things are actually happening or actually impacting his life, he, they know about it and they can rattle that list off. And so he's achieving his, he's achieving his goal there. Wow, that's uh, kind of interesting in part because I don't necessarily know that those three things are true in the broader sense of how it works. But as you're shaking your head, it may not matter to <laughs> people who are voting. And in 2016, 54% of eligible black men voted. And so if Biden is hoping to capture that black male vote, what does he need to do? I mean, what's so interesting is that Joe Biden in many ways has put together a very different coalition than the Obama Biden, the Obama Biden coalition which was anchored by overwhelming support from black voters and from voters of color. 95, 96, in some places, 98% support for Barack Obama. And what we've seen with the Biden campaign is a very different coalition. His coalition includes a lot of seniors. Joe Biden's winning the majority of voters over 65. Democrats don't win the majority of voters over 65, but Joe Biden is. He's breaking even with white voters. Democrats typically lose the white vote by 20 points. Joe Biden's breaking even. So he's putting together a very different coalition that may not require him to hit 90 or 95% with black men. But what's interesting here is that the down ballot candidates, Democrats attempt to take back the Senate, they are going to require 90 and 95% support from black men. So in places like, uh, like, like North Carolina, Cal Cunningham needs 95% of black folks in North Carolina. In places like Michigan, Gary Peters is running against a black man and his Republican, his Republican opponent in Michigan. He's gonna to need to run up 95%. And so Democrats, not just Joe Biden, who has put together a pretty solid and diverse winning coalition, Democrats now need to lean in and not just give black men someone to vote against, but they have to give them someone to vote, something to vote for in their down ballot candidates. Indeed, I think I've definitely heard that sentiment echoed across the board with members of the black community feeling like they have no incentive necessarily to vote for a particular candidate. Although I think now Biden is definitely resonating with a number of people and hopefully there will be some valid change. But I know we don't have that much time left and you had mentioned that you had a sample group and you had something you wanted to share about that, please do. Well, you know, as we get closer and closer to this election, I'm beginning to spend more time in our research and our focus groups, understanding how people will react to the outcome of the election. And even more so, what might happen in that uncertain period where we may not know the outcome for a little while. And, you know, the, the, the damage that this president has done, some of it I, can, I think may be irreparable damage that he is doing to the country. And one of them that I didn't expect, but that is very, very, very startling is that most of the, of the um, young black voters that I just spoke to in this focus group actually anticipate the, the outcome of this election resulting in violence. Um, unanimously, everyone in the group expects this election to end in violence. And I asked them, have you ever thought that before? That depending on who won or lost, that our country might break out into violence. And they said they never have. And so I'm afraid that that what he's inciting, when you tell racist groups to stand back and stand by, when you encourage your support supporters to go into inner cities and watch people vote, I'm afraid of that that we have to really start to message 
to our voters, you know, the civility of our elections and how we defend the integrity of our elections without breaking into violence or civil war. That's just not who we are as a nation. Well, hey, who we are as a nation is a very hotly debated issue. And I would say we have a history of a lot of violence and problems, but let's hope there will be no war of 2020. But also, since now we're closing up, I want people to have the opportunity to know where they can catch you. Please tell them where they can find you. Yeah, we release data every day. We release focus group clips and data and findings every day on our Twitter, T underscore Woodbury. That's T underscore W O O D B U R Y. Or at the company at hitstrat.com, at hitstrat on Twitter. You can always find what we're doing there. Thank you, Terrence. And I cannot believe you came on my show and said Trump was a master marketer. That I will never forgive you for. But I do appreciate you coming on. Terrence Woodbury, owner and principal of Hit Strategies. Thank you so much, Adrian. Like what you see, click the subscribe button below and don't forget to ring the bell to never miss another video from the Young Turks.